Uh, good morning, members. We have a quorum, and can I call the meeting to order? Boyhlam Falsha Korov Gagdena Kugar Krinu and you, Goharaha and Boyle Shin Ahagan Lin Erin Fone. I'd like to welcome you all here this morning, uh, and in, in particular to welcome our panel and our members on the, who are coming in by phone, uh, which has allowed us to continue meeting throughout the coronavirus crisis um, on a weekly basis and sometimes twice weekly basis, and still maintain the social distancing. So I thank you for all of that. I recognise that it is a bit more difficult um, to manage in that in that sense, but it's appreciated that that, that you are doing that. So, can I remind all members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? Um, so, we have a full yeah we have full attendance this morning, so no apologies. In terms of chairperson's business, then regarding item six, the children's social care statutory regulation, we have received a range of substantial and important submissions on that SR, raising a number of issues worth considering. Um, can I therefore propose, members, that we go ahead with our stakeholder panel this morning, but take a little further time to look at the evidence and defer consideration of the SR itself until the 11th of June. Uh, the statutory period runs until September, so we do have time to do that. Would members be content with that approach? Content. Okay, thank you. Item three, then, draft minutes. Can I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 20th of May, which are ta at tab 3.1? Of the meeting pack, are members content with those minutes? Content. Yep, members content. Thank you. Can I also refer you members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the twenty-first of May, which are at tab three point two of your meeting pack? Are members content content with the seconds those minutes? Yep, members content. Okay, uh, I advise members that there are no matters arising. So we're moving on then to item five, which is our COVID-19 disease response work. The impact today, we're looking at the very, very uh, important area of the impact of the pandemic on children. And we've asked a range of stakeholders to brief us this morning. I refer members to papers at tab five of the pack and tab five of the table of papers. Can I advise members that representatives from organisations in the children and young people sector are here today via teleconference to brief the Committee on Issues of Child Protection and Wellbeing arising from the pandemic. We have invited them to comment also on SR 2020 forward slash 78, the Children's Social Care Coronavirus Regulations referred to earlier. So I would like to now welcome Ms Alicia Toll, Chief Executive, Voice of Young People in Care, or VoIPIC. Are you there, Alicia? I am, Chair. Thank you. Uh, and also Corfalcherev, Miss Kathleen Toner, Director of the Fostering Network. And I, Kathleen, Kathleen, are you with us there? I am indeed, yes. Thanks. And finally, on our panel this morning, Miss Michelle James, Head of Bernardo's. G Michelle, are you there? I am, yes. Okay, so I would now like to invite our panel to brief the committee and then we will do a, do a question and answer session. So if the panel could please go ahead now and give us your briefing. Thank you. Um, good, good morning, Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for your invitation to talk this morning about the modifications to the statutory rules and the experiences of young people at this time. Voice of Young People in Care is an independent children's charity founded in 1993 to promote the rights and voice of children in care and care leavers. We believe that every child in care should experience positive relationships, safety, stability and be empowered to transform their life. Our work with young people has three strands. Our independent advocacy service delivered on behalf of the Health and Social Care Board enables children to represent their views and feelings in care planning and decision making. Participation provides safe and supported spaces to connect and explore issues relating to care. And finally, influencing change, working in partnership with children and young people to influence legislation policy and practice. Our conversations here today are about people, about the near 3,500 young people in care and the thousands of young people with lived experience across Northern Ireland. 
We appreciate that the additional pressures the threat of COVID-19 and lockdown measures have placed on carers and families, and I'll leave those concerns to my colleagues from the Foster Network and Bernardo's, concentrating solely on the challenges and experiences of children and young people. I'll briefly comment on the statutory regulations and guidance before speaking more widely on the issues highlighted to us by young people we support. I'd like to acknowledge the invitation to meet with departmental officials during the drafting of the guidance, and I welcome the amendments made which reflect some of those discussions. Our comments now come under two broad headings, supporting young people through communication technology and care and pathway planning and review. Contact and visits from social workers and others, including advocates, are important protective measures that help keep children safe. At this time, many children and young people are in need of more and better contact with their social worker. Contact should be as frequent as is required by each individual child. The regulations provide for flexibility around how statutory visits can take place using audiovisual technology. For some young people, meeting by telephone or video call is not enough. It's essential that using robust risk assessment, vulnerable young people continue to be visited face-to-face where appropriate and in line with guidance and social distancing. When face-to-face visits absolutely cannot take place, communication and meetings via video conferencing must be prioritised. A reliable internet connection and connected devices are essential. And we're concerned that some young people, including some care leavers, those living in a number of children's homes and in certain rural areas, do not have sufficient access to the internet. We know that some young individual young people do not have an internet-enabled devices for safeguarding and protection reasons. And while it's right to be cautious about access to the internet for more vulnerable young people, we have to recognise how essential it is in light of the current situation. It's not acceptable for any young person to be denied at least limited access to the internet and we'd call on the trust to develop risk management plans for young people's online access, which does not include its total removal. This new move to methods of communication and practice represents a huge cultural shift in children's services. Trusts must be fully resourced and supported to make this change with investment in services alongside training and support for staff and carers to ensure they have the appropriate equipment, technology and skills to engage young people, involve them in decision making and help them enjoy contact with family and friends. The review of a child's care plan or a young adult's pathway plan is the most important mechanism for involving them in decisions being made about their life. It's a key forum whereby they can exercise the right to participate and access other rights and entitlements. Most young people we spoke to understand the need for flexibility at this time. We acknowledge that guidance says extensions to the pathway plan review timescales should only happen when they're needed. We strongly advocate that review meetings must take place within normal timescales if practical or sooner if circumstances change, new risks are identified or if requested by a young person. We ask trusts to ensure that where a decision is made to delay, this will be evidenced and communicated to the young person affected. Where a child wants to attend and participate in a review meeting, they must be facilitated to do so and offered advocacy support to take part. In the early stages of lockdown, young people were anxious and worried about the spread of the virus and the implications of lockdown and contact with family and friends. They found it difficult to understand why their non-care experienced peers were allowed to move between households of separated parents. Relationships with carers came under pressure when some people, young people, ignored restrictions. As time has progressed, young people are more informed and generally understand the restrictions and the rationale for these. They have adapted reasonably well and have sought out ways to combat loneliness, stay active and entertained while staying home. Most young people have had multiple contacts with their social worker since the lockdown began, usually on the phone. The importance of visual communication for a child or young person cannot be underestimated, especially for those with communication difficulties. For those young people who'd participated in a review meeting via Zoom, most were happy with it. Some prefer using video conferencing to being in a room full of people, while others felt the meeting was rushed and not allowed to develop properly. Through all our conversations, it's clear what young people miss most is friends and family. Many are worried about older relatives or those with health concerns they're unable to visit. Their experience of new ways of having family time and contact varies across the region. 
For many, it's limited to telephone contact. As time has progressed, video platforms are being utilised. However, more effort is required to increase the availability and access to these. For a few young people, audiovisual technology is intimidating and makes them feel awkward. And so they don't use it to keep in contact with friends or family. This puts them at even greater risk of isolation, loneliness, poor mental health and well-being. As we move through the pandemic, we must be sure to capture their learning from this time. How we use technology to enhance our work with young people is one key area. While it must never be seen as a substitute for face-to-face -face contact, we have much to learn from our experience during these months. Young people of school age tell us to continue to be engaged in education, receiving packs of work from schools and regular contact with teachers. The amount of time spent on schooling varies, with most doing between two and four hours per day. While they miss the social aspects of school and acknowledge that face-to-face -face learning is preferable, most were content with how they are currently receiving education. We know that there are specific challenges for young people who have left care. We must ensure that they all have the support and the resources required to be safe and to keep well. We have to support their mental health and emotional well-being. Some are struggling to cope with the circumstances and have resorted to alternative but harmful coping strategies, which only serves to further impact emotional health and well-being. It's important no young person is forced out to move where they live, to age out of services, or have to make crucial life decisions at this time. As we move through this phase of the pandemic, robust arrangements must be put in place to capture data and monitor the impact on children and young people in care and care leavers. Through our ongoing relationship-based practice with young people, VoIPIC is ideally placed to support this work. This data and information will assist the review and the impact of changes made on children and families and will inform future planning. VoIPIC continues to support children and young people in and moving through care at this time. We believe that every child in care should have positive relationships, safety and stability, be empowered to transform their lives, even in these most uncertain and challenging of times. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, Kathleen, are you uh, there as well? Do you want to present to the committee also? Yes, thank you. Um, good morning, Chair and members of the committee, and thank you also for the opportunity to address the committee today. Um, as you said, I'm Kathleen Toner and I'm the director of the Fostering Network in Northern Ireland. And the Fostering Network is the UK's leading charity uh, for foster care and transforming children's lives is very much the heart of everything we do. As a membership organisation also, we bring together individuals and services involved in foster care right across the north and throughout the UK to effect positive change to improve the lives of children and young people in foster care. In Northern Ireland, all five health and social care trusts and all independent voluntary fostering providers are members of our organisation and 100% of all of their approved foster and kinship foster carers, approximately 2,700 carers, are all. And we have very much based our comments on comments. But what things are what is the on the temporary regulation? Families are. Kathleen, we're, we're, we're kind of losing you there. You've gone very indistinct. Can you hold? Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. And actually, just in general, for members of the panel, um, it's better if you have access to earphones or a headset. That's usually better. But that's better now, Kathleen, if you can keep that. I have my headset on here. So hopefully, um, is that any better now? Yes, I think that's better now, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, do you need me to go back over any of this, Chair? Just please do start again, Kathleen, yes. Okay, no problem. Um, so I started off just by thanking you for the opportunity um, and just to say that the Fostering Network is the UK's leading foster care charity with transforming children's lives being at the heart of everything we do. As a membership organisation, we bring together individuals and services involved in foster care right across the north and across the UK to effect positive change to improve the lives of children and young people in foster care. In Northern Ireland, all health and social care trusts and all independent voluntary fostering providers are members of our organisation and 100% of their approved foster and kinship foster carers, approximately 2,700, are members and our comments are based on evidence drawn from them. You will have seen our submission to the committee which details more fully our views on the temporary regulation the impact of the pandemic on fostering families and some thoughts on emerging from lockdown. But in the time allotted to me this morning, 
I'll make some comments about the temporary modification of the children's social care regs, highlight the need for a comprehensive review fostering regulations here, and comment on the impact of the pandemic on children in foster care. In relation to the temporary measures which came into force on the 6th of May, we note amendments made by the Department following consultation with stakeholders. Given that the temporary rules remove the requirement to have a final enhanced disclosure certificate in order to finalise foster care approval, we were reassured to know that these changes will be focused on the child's best interests, will be time limited, subject to monitoring and scrutiny, and will only be used in exceptional circumstances. We're not still fully, obviously, out of the lockdown period of this pandemic, and we're all aware of the warnings of a second and possibly third surge until we find a vaccine. As such, it's important that all government work agencies work in partnership collaboratively with statutory partners and other partners and stakeholders to identify the lessons of this period and ensure plans are in place for future outbreaks. As an organisation, it has been interesting for us to see amendments to foster care regulation being taken forward. In 2015-16, along with the wider fostering sector, we very much welcomed the development of updated draft regulations on foster care which we considered would make a more robust framework for foster care, which included provision for the introduction of standards for non-relative foster care here. And we were somewhat disheartened when they went before the final health committee in 2015-16 that they weren't agreed and that they remain incomplete. We feel these would have been helpful framework at this particular time of pandemic and we would welcome progress towards these being implemented. You will know that um, Alicia talked about the numbers of children who are in care and almost 2,700 of those children currently live in fostering households and each one of those children has their own story, their own unique circumstances, their own experiences, their own needs. Over the last 8 to 10 weeks we've heard a variety of experiences from our foster and potential foster care members about the impact of the pandemic. Many reported their house has not been impacted in any particularly negative way and did note positive aspects such as spending quality time with family, enjoying the good weather, um, not having the pressures of school was bringing them closer together and enabled them to engage in family activities. However, others did report they had concerns about their family's health and safety. And while contact with birth families moved very quickly and often successfully online, there is no doubt that it didn't work for all children. Families um, in foster, fostering families had concerns about managing homeschooling and about access to resources. Within the fostering network, we deliver fostering attainment and achievement a service which aims to improve the educational outcomes of looked after children in foster care using foster carers as primary educators. And over the last number of weeks, we've been in touch with hundreds of those families and we've worked hard to provide emergency IT equipment to ensure young people could, ex could access online materials, do schoolwork and continue to engage with learning. Again, some young people have enjoyed this but find it, and find it less stressful than school, which for many children in foster care can be a challenging space. However, some miss the daily structure and routine at school, the social aspects of meeting friends. They felt isolated. Some disengaged and this caused um, their foster carers to express concerns about the missing out on school, but it also did lead in some situations to ch more challenging behaviour. While lockdown has created space and time for children to bond with their foster carers and their families, to connect and in some cases to reconnect, there remains concerns about children's emotional health and well-being as we emerge from lockdown. Educational outcomes for looked after children continue to be much lower than those for the general population for a variety of reasons, emotional difficulties, the impact of abuse or neglect, frequent changes of school, attachment issues, the impact of trauma. We believe that returning to school will have to be really carefully managed and emotional health and well-being will need to be a clear priority. A traumatised child will struggle to learn in any environment at home or in school. So a trauma-informed approach will be absolutely vital. In conclusion, there is still some way, as we know, to go before we return to normal, and the full impacts of the coronavirus are not yet known. Working together has never been more important, and listening to and learning from those impacted is absolutely essential to provide a crucial learning opportunity to discover and implement new and better ways to support children in care and, um, and look after them better. Thank you.
Thank you, Kathleen. And we'll go now, finally, then to Michelle. Michelle, are you there? And can you go ahead and present to the committee, please? Yes. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. And thank you for the invitation to speak to the committee today on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on children and young people. As you said, my name is Michelle James. I'm the head of Bernardo's Northern Ireland. Bernardo's is the largest children's charity in Northern Ireland with more than 40 services delivering support to around 12,000 children and young people and families each year. We work in a trauma-informed way across a diverse range of areas, including mental health and well-being, child sexual abuse, children who are looked after or leaving care, disability, refugee integration, and family support. The committee will have received our written response to the children's social care coronavirus regulations. I'll not repeat the detail of these points here, and many have already been raised, but I do wish to highlight that while we recognise the current challenges, it's essential that the needs rights and voice of the child must be central to any changes. <coughs> any changes should be closely monitored to ensure that they are not detrimental to the well-being of our most vulnerable children. And we'd urge the committee to ensure these are temporary changes and will be reversed sooner if found to be harmful. This pandemic has presented a challenge like no other to Bernardo's history. Though most of our buildings are now closed, we've not stopped delivering services to support those who need us thanks to the innovation and commitment of our teams across Northern Ireland. Coronavirus has had an impact on every service we deliver and on every age group we work with. Every child and every family is different. We are seeing the pandemic impact in a range of ways and we're working to support families and alleviate challenges wherever possible. These can be broadly grouped into three areas, safeguarding, poverty and mental health. In terms of safeguarding, we are very concerned that child protection issues are not being identified during this time. Given the absence of the usual support systems and safe spaces such as schools, we are worried that more families are being pushed into crisis and that places the most vulnerable children in the greatest danger. We would usually expect to see an increase of safeguarding issues just before or during periods of school closure such as summer holidays particularly in our early intervention services or our drug, drug and alcohol misuse services. However, we are currently seeing a reduction in the numbers of reports. Our worry is that this reflects that the voice of the child has been reduced and risk is not being identified, so the harm remains hidden. This is particularly worrying given we know there are current risks. We know that there's been an increase in domestic abuse calls to police and health lines during lockdown. And we would also be concerned that increased online traffic may lead to an increased risk of online harm, including grooming and sexual exploitation. So there's an even greater need to identify risk and prevent harm. We fully recognise the need to put systems in place to address the threat of coronavirus, and we're supportive of that. However, we also need to ensure that protections for the most vulnerable in our society are preserved throughout this time. We are also concerned that many families have been pulled into poverty during the pandemic and that this will impact children. The current reliance on digital devices for children and young people to access education as well as maintain friendships throughout this period has also highlighted digital poverty as an issue. Our services are working to support families experiencing poverty, for example through providing food, parcels, vouchers, fuel vouchers, or helping access the free school payments. But again, the worry is that some families will remain hidden. Finally, we are also seeing an impact on the mental health and well-being on children and young people. A recent survey of all Bernardo's practitioners highlighted that mental health, and as Alicia highlighted as well, isolation and loneliness are among the most common concerns for children and young people during this time. We are seeing this in our services. For example, with young people leaving care or who are perhaps living independently for the first time, or where the current context is amplifying a previous trauma. We also need to recognise the increased pressure on parents, particularly those caring for children with complex needs and disability, and the impact of uncertainty and changed routines on those children. Lastly, we think there's a real risk that we will see a long term impact on child mental health with more children and young people needing support for the first time ever, even after the pandemic has ended. 
That's a quick overview of some of the impacts of the pandemic on children and young people that we've seen so far. I hope it's useful uh, for the committee, and I am happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much to all of our panel, and we have. Uh, a bit over an hour for this session, so hopefully all members will get, if we maybe do our usual pattern of taking a couple of questions each, and then we might get around to, <coughs> to an additional question, um, depending on how we're going. I suppose my first question would be in relation to, uh, and it applies probably to all of you equally, but in terms of the right of the child to be heard and to be taken seriously, which constitutes one of the key elements of the United Nations Article 12, do you believe that, that the rights of the child to be heard are being sufficiently addressed within, within the legislation as it's planned at the present time? And are there other things that could be done to, to kind of balance that or, or promote the rights of children who we all recognise are some of the most vulnerable people that we have under our, under our care? So do you think that balance has been found in terms of the, uh, the SR? And that's over to the panel there, whoever, whoever wants to lead off on that. Maybe Voipek? Alicia? Uh, yes, Chair. Um, absolutely, the right of the child to be heard um, is paramount consideration for us, and a lot of our work of our advocacy service is supporting those young people to take part in care planning meetings and review meetings. Um, our perspective is that where trust are able to go ahead and adhere to the normal timescales, they should do so. Um, and we saw that the reference to that in the guidance has been strengthened where trusts are encouraged to adhere to normal timescales. And I suppose that for us is, is very important. We also know that particularly in the early stages of lockdown in April, that a number of review meetings were cancelled. Um, so this month and um, in the weeks ahead, we want to make sure that any backlog um, is addressed and that, where possible, we maintain the current timescale so that young people's rights to be heard aren't diluted. Okay, thank you. Um, any other answers on that from the panel, or are you content with that? This is Kathleen. Yes, Kathleen. Donor. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I would agree with Alicia. I think um, in our situation, obviously, we work with fostering families, and so we would often be hearing from the people who are looking after the children in, in their own homes. I suppose some of the challenges um, are around the fact that uh, in terms of, say, online contact, for example, where you have very young children who are perhaps pre-verbal, that online contact doesn't really work for them, as you'll appreciate. Um, I do think, though, that uh, the sort of strengthening of the guidance has reassured us in terms of ensuring that timescales remain in place. And it would be my understanding that all the fostering providers are working alongside those guidance and still trying to implement them as far as they can. I do think that we need to hear from children and young people. I think their voices have been quite silent during the pandemic. And, um, and I understand why, as people have moved into their own homes. But I don't think it has been particularly a feature of our sort of public debate. And, and I do think that there is scope for that perhaps to happen as we move forward into um, the beginning of lift, our lockdown being lifted. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes. Here, I've just come in very briefly. I agree with both um, Alicia. Um, and Kathleen there, I suppose, just in terms of ensuring the ongoing uh, hearing of the voice of the child. Um, uh, the, for me, in terms of visits to, to children, that's really important. And I know we're talking about using technology, and it's a very useful communication tool to engage with our children and young people. But as Kathleen says, there's not a, some children are not always able to use it. They may be pre-verbal. They may have a disability that prevents them, or as Alicia referenced earlier, some children are not comfortable um, with using different types of technology. So we need to um, risk assess different ways of how we do that. We've had some experience um, in relation to uh, visits to children's homes. We've conducted conversations um, with uh, children and young people using social distancing. So even at the, the bottom of the, the, the the gate, if you like, or in the, in the garden, because I think that face-to-face -face contact is so important 
to ensure we're really hearing directly from the child that there's nobody alongside them, um, you know, talking while they're on the phone or on the video chat or whatever. So it's, I think it's, it's important not only that it's embedded within the regulation, but it's, a, it's part of practice and implementation going forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, my next question is in relation to the looked after children specifically and the cliff edge, which we all know exists largely and, and, and very, very impacts greatly on looked after children in moving from out of, out of children's services or young people's services into adult services. Is there a concern that this could exacerbate that problem, if not correctly dealt with, and put already disadvantaged and marginalised young people at further risk of, of uh, falling out of services or falling between services? Would there be a concern and, and are there suggestions of ways that could mitigate that risk? I'll start there with WIPEC maybe as well on that one. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Well, I think those issues that you've highlighted there, that movement from children's services into adult services, there was already difficulties there before COVID-19 um, and the processes. So I think that is part of the need to gather good quality data and information directly from young people about the impact to see what exactly um, has been their experience in these at this moment in time moving to services we know that young people can find that move from children into for example adult mental health services and um, there can be very difficult and they often want um, and need a period of transition but I recognise also that there has been work ongoing within the, um, the health board to address the, the model of care um, for, in mental health in particular. Thank you. And does any of the other panellists want to take that? If, if I could just say something, Chair, and Kathleen Toner again. Um, yeah, Kathleen. I think that young people who are living in foster care who are over the age of um, 18 are under the GEM scheme, which is going the extra mile scheme. And usually young people are in that service um, because they are in employment, training or education. I do understand that I think some of the wider regulations, not necessarily these particular ones, do um, allow for any disruption around the education of young people. I know that it is something that we have looked at right across our organisation in terms of post-18 care. Um, with disruption to um, further and higher education and um, training institutions, etc., we're really not clear if young people are going to actually be able to avail of opportunities made available to them. Um, and certainly this would be the time of year when they're getting offers or they're looking at future options. Um, and I think that in terms of uh, education and training and employment opportunities, we need to be very vigilant around um, making sure that those young people don't, as you say, fall off that cliff edge that is a possibility. Thank you. And Michelle, did you want to contribute anything on that? Yes, just briefly. Um, just to say, because I feel very strongly that our children who are in care, leaving care, should be afforded the same um, opportunities as those who are not in care and um, you know we wouldn't be asking our own children to move um, during this um, pandemic and we shouldn't be asking any child to so I, I, I would be very concerned if I thought that um, some children would be being asked and our young people would be being asked to be moved during this, this time in a, you know if that was part of their plan we should be reviewing care plans regularly things shouldn't be drifting um, and, you know but um, children shouldn't be being asked to, to move just because they've turned 18. Okay, thank you. Um, on the digital exclusion, and I know Bernarders have addressed it there, but on the digital exclusion, you've, you've identified uh, particular communication challenges, particular risks that might arise from that. But there's also the issue of geographic digital ex exclusion in terms of rural broadband and the ability to participate in Zoom meetings or, or meetings of that nature. Um, do the panel think that that issue has been addressed or uh, has been addressed to the satisfaction of yourselves that that risk is mitigated? Can I come in there, Chair, yeah. yourself, James, from Bernardas, we've talked quite extensively about digital poverty. Um, rurality is one of the issues. I live out in the countryside myself and um, have real difficulties at times with, with access. 
but it's not just about devices and it's not just about where you live, it's also about what you can afford. You know, lots of our family um, can't afford the device, can't afford the data, can't afford the um, additional cost of, of um, you know, the extra fuel bills. They're working on reduced income at the moment. And so there's a whole, um, I suppose, exasperation of inequality, if you like. Um, I did talk to Ofcom as well, just about you know how we ensure that, that everybody has the same sort of access, because it doesn't just mean that people are isolated or unable to talk to their friends. It means that our children and young people are not able to access some of the education resources that have been put in place. And, you know, we, we need to, to be pushing a bit more for that. I know we were really welcome um, the Education Minister's um, proposal around the, the devices, but it's not just about devices, as you say, it's about where people live, whether the internet connection is sufficient and whether they can actually afford to have it, because people are, at the minute especially, are feeding their children first um, before they even think about other bills. Okay. So and if I could add something, yeah, yeah. Chair, it's um, Alicia from VoIPEC here. Um, and I think as well as the access and availability, it's also uh, what's important to remember is how we support carers um, and the adults who are around children on a day-to-day -day basis to support them so that they know how to use the technology. Um, because there's so many different platforms being trialled right now and we know that some of our carers are maybe older and maybe don't have that technical ability. So how we can support them to get that knowledge and um, help them to learn some of the skills to engage young people online, it does take a, um, a different skill set um, and practice really in using these new technologies to be able to really involve young people, engage them well and make sure that their voice is being heard. Thank you. Okay, thank you for those responses. I'll now go, I have uh, the first two indications of the room are from Paula and Pam and then I'm going to go to the phones and then I'll come back to the room and I have Alex and Colin indicating that stage and Jerry. So I'll go then to you, Paula. Um, thank you and good morning, ladies. Um, my first question, thanks um, to the lady from Bernardo's, it's around the voice of the child and the, the hidden harm during this pandemic. And I'm just wondering what, what do you see are possible solutions as we move through the pandemic in terms of gearing up to provide you know, quite rapid response whenever social distancing and, and other measures um, um, are start to be lifted, you know, in terms of what support should we be providing organisations like yourself or statutory? Yeah, over to the panel, please, for that one. Yes, thank you um, for your question. I suppose at the minute, I, I, I want to be really clear that while we are not, some of our buildings aren't open, we are continuing to deliver um, services. We have staff on the front line, our residential services are all still open, and we're working directly with children in a children's home, in um, our residential living care services, and in our uh, disability short break services. Um, all of our counselling services that are attached to schools are still open and we have to adapt those and we'll continue to do that um, until somebody says you know, it's okay to come back to the schools. I'm worried that even when schools are open, because they'll want to reduce the footfall, that they might not want um, additional I suppose, external providers coming into schools. So it may be that we have to continue to offer um, our counselling services in a different way for the foreseeable future. Um, so I, I think what we need to be doing, though, is looking at um, the bigger picture in terms of where counselling is available for our children and our young people, because it's not on an equal footing right across Northern Ireland, and it's not available for every age group. So I think we need to be looking at that. Counselling is only one option. Um, I um, anticipate that you know the impact on our children and young people is going to be evident for a very long time so we need to be planning for a longer term intervention not short bursts so you can have that for a few months and you can have that for a few months we need to have um, really uh, good services available on the longer term the other bit is that counseling is only one option another option is about building resilience within our children um, and there's a number of really good programs and supports out there that we could be doing working alongside schools um, Kathleen talked earlier about working better together, and that's the only way 
um, that we're going to be able to to help our children and young people um, uh, whenever things open up. So you're right, Paula, it does need to be rapid. We are thinking, we're, we're, we're talking to our services every week about what we need to do, what are our children and young people telling us. There's a whole range and one size isn't going to fit all. So we need to think very carefully, not on our own, but alongside our children, our young people and their families and alongside our, our partners and other stakeholders within the community. Thank you. Uh, thank perhaps you. I could add to that, this is Kathleen. Um, I think we've looked at the capacity of our sector and I don't think there's any doubt we're going to see an increase in referrals to children's services as um, lockdown starts to lift. And, and I suppose from our perspective, that could potentially mean that there's a greater need for people to look after children. So if our numbers of young people coming into care increases, we will need to have the resources in place to enable um, us to respond. And for the last number of years, recruitment for foster carers has been quite challenging. Um, interestingly, during the pandemic, all the fostering providers, statutory and independent, have indicated to us that they have seen something of an increase in inquiries for people, from people who wish to consider foster care. And that is something that we haven't perhaps seen for a while. And I think it's indicative of the fact that people are wanting to give back um, something in, in these um, very unusual circumstances. But we would need to have a targeted approach and we would need to ensure that um, the provisions are in place to enable recruitment of foster carers and approval of foster carers to happen rapidly if there is a further surge. Um, I also think that we have uh, emerging needs that some of us maybe haven't even thought about yet and assessment is never going to be more important as well and we need to be gathering intelligence, gathering data, looking at trends, opening up our um, thought process to think, processes to things that maybe we haven't perhaps anticipated in the past and that we need to be thinking about additional contingency plans the minute to put in place for children's services providers for a further search. And those plans, as Michelle said, need to absolutely must be collaborative across all the providers to ensure there aren't any gaps as far as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. And actually, actually, I should have... Go ahead, Paula. Second question. I thought that was the second question. Go ahead. No, well, it was more just around, just to get a wee bit more information then in terms of the draft regulations for fostering. And as you said, it was 2015-16. And I'm just wondering why they've been Hello. stuck in the system for so long. Hello. Can you, hear, can you hear us? Yeah. Can you hear us? Did you hear Paula's question there? No. No. I was no. focused towards Kathleen. Um, it was yeah. to do with the draft regulations around fostering, and I was just wondering why they've been stuck in the system since 2015-16. If you can give us a wee bit more information on that, because that was in the last mandate. Well, I, I guess um, they went to the the very last health committee, Paula, of the last mandate, and um, it is a, a very large schedule of um, regulations and uh, the committee at that point wanted more information. And um, because that was the last health committee, regrettably there, there wasn't one for, for several years after that. So, um, and I think that you know, fostering services and indeed the department have worked really hard to try and put provisions in place to enable us to continue to deliver services. But those regulations, really, we would welcome them being brought forward as, forward as um, soon as reasonably practicable because they will put in place a series of standards for foster care that we can look to and work towards. Our, our regs are currently 1996 and, and it would be a really, really welcome um, development uh, that we could see those being taken forward perhaps over the next period. Thank you. Thank you. And I actually was going to say there, I should have actually at the, at the outset declared my own interest in terms of this area that I have worked as a social worker in, in the past and still on a career break from that career, but also that I would have worked, I think, with every one of, of your organisations in that sense and, and would have, in, in common with many, would have very much welcomed the input and the, and the expertise and the services that you bring. But I just uh, wanted to declare that now. <laughs> I should have done earlier. Um, I'll go then across to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron. Pam. Yep. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, for your uh, presentations this morning. And we do appreciate the, the good work that you're, you're doing working with children and young people. Um, just, just a brief comment first in terms of the conversation around the um, digital exclusion and access to uh, equipment and data, etc. I'm just kind of noting um, that uh, Department of Education are 
are working with BT to provide dongle devices uh, to provide around 10 um, gig of data per child in areas where access provision is low. So I think there's an opportunity there, along with a provision of equipment, of course, um, that that could be looked at in terms of, I'm sure most of those children and young people will be um, affected in their schooling just as much as uh, in this instance. So I think that's something that could be looked at possibly going forward. But in terms of um, uh, safeguarding checks in particular, and I mean, I do think that um, any grey areas need to be ironed out with this. It's really important with that guidance, and we don't want to have indirect confusion. I think but we've lost, yeah. Yes, I, I can't hear anyone. Sorry, Sorry did, you, did you hear any of Pam's? Uh, um, I heard as much from safeguarding check. Yes. Okay. I heard digital exclusion. <laughs> oh, OK. OK. Can, can you hear me now, panel? It's a very faint. OK. I'll, I'll speak and, and you can let me know if, if you can hear me now. That's better. Yeah, is that yeah, better? Yeah, that's better. All yeah. right. Sorry about that. No, I was just mentioning, first of all, about um, the discussion around the digital exclusion and the fact that um, I'm just reading that the Department of Education um, are working with BT to provide dongle devices to provide around 10 gig of uh, data per child in areas where access to provision is low. And also they've um, committed to providing equipment as well. I'm thinking that could be a potential um, solution to the issue around the digital exclusion. Um, but I wanted to um, ask you around the uh, any grey areas in respect of safeguarding uh, and that you know I believe that those checks need to be ironed out and we don't want indirect confusion. But what I wanted to ask you as a panel was, uh, can you tell us who you believe that the changes in the regulation affect the most and is it dis disproportionate towards children in uh, any particular setting. Okay, across to did, did you did you get the question there, panel? Yeah. Yep. So uh, go ahead, please. Um, it's Kathleen Toner. Um, I um, it's, it's hard to gauge. I think I think that the um, the regulations do go right across the continuum of, of young people, you know, who are in care and don't touch on care leavers. Um, but I'm not sure that there's any one particular group or, or age range. That maybe some of the other panel, pa our panel members might have a view on that. Yeah, this is uh, Alicia from VoIPEC. Um, Pam, if I can just go back to talk uh, about the digital exclusion, and you're right, um, particularly over the last number of weeks, we have seen a, a lot of efforts to address the um, kind of digital poverty. So, and our advocates are working with young people, and will be trying to access that scheme you referred to. But we're also working in partnership with the children's homes to look at getting creative uh, solutions for them, um, and to try and make sure that they have that young people there have access to tablets, so that we can have ongoing communication with their advocates. And we're also aware then that there's other initiatives within the voluntary sector um, and we're looking to ways that we can also support statutory services and making sure that um, young people do have access to technologies and to the internet. I suppose in terms of the regulations where um, we feel that uh, where children will be most affected is probably um, those young people who are coming into care um, and those amendments to timescales of the reviews for first and second reviews. Um, but, all, but we are um, glad to see that the guidance has been strengthened and as we've mentioned earlier, you know, where a trust can adhere to timescales and um, that they should. And I suppose it's how that data is gathered around that so that we can learn afterwards whether or not um, the guidance and the amendments were used in the spirit they were intended. There are for, um, I think there are, and I've mentioned it already, particular issues for care leavers. And um, Colm did talk earlier about the transition to adult services, but I suppose now, for me, I would like to flag the pressure on accommodation and places to live for young people who are just moving out of care. So they're still within um, children's services, although moving into leaving and aftercare services. We know that there was already a pressure 
on placements for a number of reasons. Um, as Kathleen has quite rightly said, we do need more uh, foster families and people who want who will care for children. Um, but also, particularly, we need accommodation for those young people who are moving out of care, different types of supported accommodation where young people can get help with um, emotional health, well-being, um, and all of the other issues that we've, we've discussed. Chair, if I could just add, Kathleen Toner, um, yes, in yeah. terms of digital um, poverty, within our Fostering Attainment and Achievement Scheme, which is commissioned by the Health and Social Care Board, we have provided, um, I think, about 250 computers over the last eight weeks to children and young people in foster care and centres and peripherals, as they call them. Um, but we also work really um, closely with a number of organisations who put parental controls on those um, pieces of hardware before they're actually delivered to families. This is something we've been doing for quite a long time with children in foster care. The, the fostering attainment and achievement model is a really good one in terms of making provision to vulnerable young people. And it's something that we as a small voluntary organisation can do really quickly and flexibly. And we have all the provisions in place. And um, we were by the Minister for Education and, and actually there is a model already in place that we utilise to ensure that um, that provision is in place. We actually review it annually and we ensure that safeguards are very much to the fore in terms of the delivery of those. I think there's one really important comment to make is that um, provision to children and young people of IT is really important. But if it's being used for contact and you have perhaps parents, birth parents on the other end who have very limited access to IT or limited skills, then um, you're not really squaring that circle. And you need to think about all of the people involved in those processes. So very well, the young person have an access to IT and online support. But if their family members don't, then it is going to limit their access. Thank you. Yeah. Chair, I think that's a very good, a very good point. If there's nobody at the end of the phone, that's not, the IT is not going to be much good done. Just on on my second question, Chair, um, I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to get some clarity, maybe for Kathleen. Um, could you tell us, Kathleen, foster care approvals have, have they continued throughout the pandemic, um, and those that have been recently approved, are, are they still able to go ahead? Yeah, my understanding is that right across both the independent and statutory sector that um, uh, approval processes are continuing and, and I know that there was a lot of work done very early on to maximise the um, foster care workforce, if you like, that um, uh, agencies looked at the foster carers they had, they went back to see if they had any spare capacity, they talked to their emergency respite carers to see if they would be willing to step up um, and you'll know that there are provisions for potentially for child minders um, and potential adoptive um, parents to be considered in um, situations where we might need to increase the numbers. So I do think there has been quite a lot of work done um, right across the sector in terms of being ready, if you like, and able to uh, address those issues. I do think, though, that we have had a challenge um, you know, for quite some time in terms of both recruitment and retention. Of foster carers and I do think we had a very successful foster care fortnight over the last couple of weeks um, and we work collectively right across uh, all our statutory and independent fostering providers and I have been speaking to some of those agencies and they're telling me they've had a very positive response. The approval process does take a little bit of time and, and you will understand why because it's necessary safeguards that need to be put in place to ensure that those people um, can safely and appropriately look after children and be appropriately matched. So it's my understanding that you know panels have gone online, that they've been virtual and that they have continued to move on apace. But there is no doubt that we still need to keep the momentum up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I'm now going to go across to the phones there and uh, Pat, you are in first on the phone. Do you are you there and have you a question? Pat, yes, I'm here, yep. Chair. Yep, go ahead, yes, Pat. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask uh, the panel their views on what they think needs to happen when the restrictions are eased and the, the schools reopen. 
Um, it's already been stated that educational outcomes among uh, looked after children is, is, is already lower than the average. And um, given the situation, I think someone mentioned that some of the curves uh, may actually be uh, in the older age bracket, fewer technology skills and so on. So may not be able to help as much uh, with the homeschooling. Uh, and and it, it's also been mentioned that uh, schools, when they do want, uh, when they do reopen, will want to reduce the footfall. So your own organisations will be uh, less welcome, and, and and therefore the assistance that you give at the minute uh, perhaps isn't going to be there. So I'm wondering, in in terms of a strategy uh, between health and education. What, what do you think needs to happen to ensure that looked after children don't drop further behind uh, in, in terms of their education and mental health well-being? Thank you. Yeah, over to uh, Pamela. Go ahead. Yeah, Michelle James here. I'll just come in quickly on that. I think um, the priority for when all of our schools uh, you know, start to open, and we do know there will be reduced numbers and, and there will have to be safeguards. The priority has to be our children's emotional health and wellbeing. Um, we, we, ha we have to be working together and I'm, I'm glad uh, Pastor you've highlighted that. It is so important to work together and I, I don't just mean that up, up out here in the sector, I mean across government to ensure that what we're providing for our children is in, in terms of the basics at the minute we need to keep them safe, we need to feed them, we just need to make sure that they're looked after well. When they go back into education, they're going to need that as well. They're going to need the basics of learning new routines, new uh, structures, new boundaries, but they need to feel safe. And a lot of our children are going to be um, impacted by this virus in terms of anxiety. So we have to give our teachers the space um, and work alongside them to make sure that that's, that's what the focus is for the first while while we're setting children back in. They've going to have been out for what, a, a, about nine months before they go back, so there's a, there's a bit in terms of that support. The other bit is, you've rightly said, about um, parents or carers who don't have the skills in terms of um, being able to access or support the young person or the child with the homework or the homeschooling. And we've seen that not just across our our, our children who are fostered or residential, but also where our children have special needs or have disabilities where special schools haven't been open and there hasn't been the additional support, or where, where English isn't the first language. A lot of our families um, from the refugee communities um, were, you know, lots of information was sent home, it was all in English, and we've had to work really hard and quickly with them to ensure they could understand what they're supposed to be doing with our children. So there's lots of challenges um, that are right there. So it's about skilling up our parents, it's about ensuring our teachers aren't worried about getting uh, raising attainment levels immediately. It's about getting our children back into the routines and the safety and the structure of school so they feel safe. Um, and, and that, that should be the priority. Yeah. Any other panel contributions on that? Uh, uh, sorry, Alicia, go, on ahead. go ahead, Kathleen. <laughs> sorry, um, within our service, a uh, foster attainment achievement, we we actually do have the resource, some resource to um, build capacity with um, um, with foster carers and the new kinship foster carers. And it may be that um, some of the resources need to increase, and we need to target them more. I think we need to be again gathering the evidence and the information as to, to what people need and how they can support their children and young people most appropriately. I think the, the absolute focus must be on emotional health and wellbeing. The provisions at the minute do allow for children who are in foster care to attend school. Um, I think that there are concerns that children have felt quite cocooned and very safe in many ways at home. And there is a fear and anxiety, not just among the children, but um, amongst birth parents and indeed carers um, for the safety of their children going back. We absolutely have to address that. Opening schools in and of itself is not going to resolve the problem. We have a job to do in terms of ensuring that people feel comfortable and reassured that the needs of their young people will be addressed. Um, the emotional need of looking after children is something that can often hinder their capacity to learn. 
and um, and that can show then in their educational outcomes. And we have to learn the lessons of this period, and we have to take on board the impact of trauma on children's ability to learn. Um, the Education Authority do have a Children um, Looked After service, and they do have an Education Champion, and that service is really, it's really quite new. And, and I think that there are those agencies who are providing educational support of that perhaps looking at how we resource those additionally as additional needs emerge. Thank you. And Pat, do you have a second question then? No, that's, that's, that's from the chair. Thank you. Okay. I'll go then to Orlea on the phone. Orlea, are you there? And do you have your question? Yes, thank you, Chair. And um, if I could, I just have a specific question for each of the panel, just on the back of their presentations, if that's okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, yep. thank you. Um, so, Alicia, um, you had touched on the issue around um, the data and, you know, trying to collate the information to, to assist in, in review of any future changes. But it was, my question mm -hmm. to you is, do you have any um, data collated at present on you had mentioned the volume of how many children you feel may be in need of more contact in this particular period. Um, the number of face-to-face -face visits, some of those are still continuing, so do we know how many that would be? And just finally, the number of children who you think may be at a disadvantage presently as a result of not having any internet access. Um, so that's my question to Alicia, please. Yep. And Kathleen... We'll, 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 we'll get an answer on that and then we'll come back to you for the next question. Oh, so, okay. Sorry, thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Alicia, please. Yeah, okay. Um, but some of that data that you're referring to would be part of the, the normal data collection undertaken by the trusts and the, um, the health board in terms of when statutory visits have taken place and the review meetings. We are gathering uh, a huge amount of data at the moment, um, and you'll appreciate we're a reasonably small charity, we're all working remotely, so it is taking some time for us just to collate all of that. I, I know when I look at our own organisation statistics, even for April and in particular for our advocacy service, we received as many referrals in April as we would usually receive in a quarter. Um, so we know that there are um, that young people are facing particular issues and disadvantages. Um, we have, in my conversations with the department, we have offered to continue to keep gathering more qualitative information from young people. So finding out what their um, experience has been over the last number of weeks. I think one of the other panel members mentioned earlier, there is no one experience. Children and young people are experiencing everything from one end of the continuum to the other. There are young people who are having a, a positive time um, and for some young people they are not enjoying all their rights and entitlements. So um, we have committed to, in the, the weeks ahead, ongoing to continue to gather um, data and information and um, we'll be sharing that and engaging directly uh, with children and, and young people on that. Thank you. And Orlea, second question. Yep, thank, thank you, Alicia. That's really helpful. I know the committee would appreciate just as you're updating any of that data or, you know, as you're doing any of that research, it would be great to see it. Um, so thank you for that. And then, okay. Kathleen, um, you had touched on the regulations themselves and had mentioned just around obviously that um, it would be time limited, subject to scrutiny, um, and importantly that it would only be used when absolutely necessary and only in exceptional circumstances. So, just my question to you, Kathleen, is um, are you content with the threshold and the detail of what is defining an exceptional circumstance within within the regulations, just for you know to, to help out the committee in our conversations and in passing it? Thank you. I, th I think the overall principle or, or is really looking at um, the, you know, the, keeping the child at the centre of this. Um, it's really important that the needs of each individual child is risk assessed. And my understanding is, is that um, certainly the guidance that was issued and um, after consultation with stakeholders did bolster that and does require monitoring and recording of decisions. So at the minute, it's, 
it's not completely clear to us. I think once um, the regulations have um, kicked in and, and um, we can see what those decisions are, you can start to look at what patterns they might be. And organisations like ourselves and Woodpick and, and Bernardo's and others, um, and those that provide advocacy support, are there to ensure that those young people who perhaps aren't getting those are, are um, supported. Um, but I, I do think that the um, emergency provisions have been very clear that the needs of the child have to be absolutely paramount and risk assessment goes alongside that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And your final, Orlea? Yep, thank you, Kathleen. And then, Michelle, um, just following on from that then, um, you had also mentioned that obviously it, it's essential that the voice of the, the child central to any of these changes. Um, so it's not detrimental to any child um, and that the regulations should be changed if any of those are found to be harmful in any way. So I, I don't want to draw you into hypotheticals, but is there any way you can give the committee a sense of, you know, some examples of how the regulations may prove or may prove detrimental or harmful to a child? I know you had mentioned, or Alicia might have mentioned earlier, around the time scales of the reviews and the pressures on placements from, you know, young people transitioning um, the adult services and moving out of their foster homes. But is there any sort of, like, practical examples that you could give us a wee sense of, just things that we need to look out for and be mindful of, again, before we, we pass the, or decide to pass or, or reject the regulations? Thank you. Thank you for your question, Olivia. Uh, like Kathleen, children's needs must, from, from, for us, should be at the central tenet of, of any change. Um, my biggest, um, not biggest concern, but I suppose I want to be really clear that, um, that, that any change that is made is constantly, like Kathleen has said, is, is constantly reviewed and, and it's monitored. Um, I suppose I'm, a, like uh, Alicia said earlier on, I'm concerned about children who are coming into care for the first time. I don't want um, them to experience any drift in terms of their care planning, um, and I, I, you know, I, I want them. I think actually their their care plans need to be reviewed more frequently rather than than uh, less. So um, those would be the, would be one of the cohorts. I suppose I don't want to. Um, all of our children, I suppose their needs are are really really important, and I don't think any are more important than than others. But just one in terms of practical examples that for me would be our children that come into care now that that, that doesn't mean that their situations drift, that contact doesn't happen or that they um, they can't have access to the same rights as, as children who've maybe uh, been in care for, for a bit longer. Um, I, I, would, I would say, you know, that we, we need to see that this, the impact that this pandemic has had as a, a traumatic experience on, on some of our children and um, we need to be really alert to um, identifying uh, harm that's been hidden during this time. And I suppose I just, um, in, that, that would be my, my reasoning really for ensuring that we, ha we find some way to ensure that face-to-face -face visits happen and happen safely, not just for the child, but for those that are involved in them. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Th thank you, panel. Thank you, Orlea. I'm going across now to Alex. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I think it was Alicia um, mentioned about. Um, I can't sorry. hear. Could you speak a wee bit closer? If all members just speak very closely to the microphones, obviously we're having a wee bit of trouble. So go ahead. Uh, um, thank you for your presentation. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I think it was Alicia mentioned about there being an increase in domestic abuse cases. Um, how does that translate in terms of young people and, and children? Are you seeing a rise? in that and is that then having a, a knock-on effect in terms of foster care is there um, a problem with the amount of foster carers that we need and how short are we that's my first question yeah um hi it's alicia here but it was actually i think kathleen would be best place to talk about foster carers Okay. Are the numbers I'm happy required? To that, happy to do that. Um, I think um, children who are brought into care will, I mean, obviously their needs um, are absolute priority and um, they will be placed with foster care. I suppose the unknown has been, you know, how many child, more children might 
Linda Cairn, I, I welcome the fact that the department are publishing weekly figures now, and that's been really helpful because I think it can give us a sense of how many children um, are being removed from birth families. I think that there's no doubt that we can see there's an increase in domestic abuse, but children come into care for a wide variety of reasons, and that is, that is undoubtedly one of them. Um, foster carers will look after children who well, should be appropriately placed with them and that the foster care should have the need or should have the skills to address the needs that the children have. I think that um, we have struggled, I think it's fair to say, over the last few years to recruit foster carers. I, I am really heartened that over this last period and particularly during the pandemic that we are seeing more people coming forward, a much um, greater interest and and also I think that there has been a new regional approach to statutory um, foster care recruitment which has um, regionalised the approach and I think that's very much to be welcomed as well. So I do think that the, there are elements that are in place that will facilitate the recruitment um, of foster carers. I think the, the challenge will be is, is that if we get a large number of children coming into care, um, how do we respond? And um, but I think at the minute, um, Alex, just to reassure you, there, you know, there, there aren't children who aren't being placed, if you like, right. um, because uh, there aren't enough foster carers as such. There are foster carers in the system who do an incredible job, and many children are placed with kinship foster carers, um, so that retains them within their wider family circle and within their community. And in Northern Ireland, we have approximately 45% of our members who would be approved kinship foster carers and quite often as you will appreciate family members will step forward in a crisis situation and they are um, as, as a result of policy they, they first port of call in many respects to retain the child's connections with their wider family but that isn't always appropriate and it isn't always safe and we do need to continue to maintain a focus on recruitment and retention of foster carers particularly during this period. Yes, Alex, go ahead. Um, my next question is, um, what measures are in place or plans in place to help um, when we come out of the pandemic for young people and children who are suffering from emotional issues and maybe mental health issues to cope when they have to go back out into the, the, the world, as it were? Yep. Across to our panel now, who wants to lead off on that one? I'm having real difficulty hearing, um, <coughs> Chair. The, 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 qu the question was, if, if you can hear, I think the question was to, to if I captured correctly, was what is in place to support children emotionally whenever they start to, the relaxation start to come into effect and they start to return to school? Is that yeah. fair enough, Alex? Yeah. Did you uh, catch that? I think it's an issue um, here, but yeah. I'll start. Um, it kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier about planning for restrictions being eased and schools reopen. I think now is the time that, we, well, when we know we have time, now is the time to plan um, across government departments and across the voluntary and community sector and involving all stakeholders to make sure that we um, are ready uh, to help and support the mental health and the emotional well-being of young people and to ensure that actually we're not just including organisations but we're talking directly to children, young people um, and families and all of the support networks around them. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, can I just come yes. in please, uh, Michelle? I'm just going to apologise because there's somebody who decided to drill outside my window. <laughs> um, so, so apologies if, you can, if that's what you can hear. Um, just in terms of the planning, Alicia's right, we're, we're, we need to start planning now. There's been some really innovative and new types of practices that have been happening, working alongside our partners, working alongside the trusts. We have um, seconded staff into trusts and, and to work closely with them, more closely with them. I do anticipate that when um, uh, we open services again, or when we open buildings again, because services are still open, that and we start to see children and families, we are going to hear more about the harm that has been hidden during this time. And so we need to be thinking about the capacity within our community of, of stakeholders in our community, of providers. And we need to be thinking about where we need to um, target our health, but also where we need
need to change things. Okay. Thank you. And I'm going across now to Colin. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the panel for their um, presentation on what is a very, very important issue. Um, some of the most fragile and deserving young people in our communities are um, you know, requiring the, the attention in, in the best of times, and it must be incredibly difficult for them and for the people that work with them at the moment. Um, there's also, I suppose, the, the, the need for um, all young people to have socialisation, but obviously uh, in the context of the pandemic where they haven't been able to meet up with friends and peers, and that's probably added to the difficulty. And I did spend nearly 20 years as a youth worker prior to coming into the Assembly and, and know just how important it is for young people to be able to get together. Um, and I also, as a member of a Board of Governors of a school, I would regularly get updates about the young people within the school that would be on the um, lack register that would be uh, of concern to the school and would be reported on. And I think that role of the school teacher and principal and network uh, within the school has been important. And I was just wondering if you have any evidence that that absence of daily contact with school has created any difficulties, or do you feel that there is inevitably a lot of young people there that are being missed and that referrals are not being passed on because of that lack of contact? Um, Michelle, Michelle James here in Bernardo. Um, yes, um, we we did, we had a look at some data that we would routinely collate on an annual basis. So we looked at the this time last year, or just before we went on on summer holidays over the last three years, and we would routinely see an increase in referrals of a safeguarding nature um, at the this time um, because schools and teachers are the you know they're the best at identifying um, when 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 we want struggling in school or where there may be some concerns at home or or, or relationships are, are difficult and before schools were closed with a lifted phone and fair them on um, and we we've, we've seen a drop like like in social services we've seen a drop in those referrals because there are less people having eyes on our children and I suppose the concern would be then when schools and start to open and to see our children or youth workers or a wider family or other members of the community, that's when we will then get the information about the harm that is currently hidden in amongst uh, those, those families. Could I just add a comment as Kathleen Toner? Um, I think when you look at the child protection referrals, um, the highest level of referrals are made by the PSNI and the second highest level come from social services themselves. And, and I think the fact that social services are still operating, that as far as possible they're trying to do face-to-face -face visits, um, you know, that those processes are, are in place. And, and while schools are a really important aspect of the safeguarding um, framework, uh, the, the number of referrals into child protection isn't just as high from schools, but there is no doubt that schools are a very much a protective factor. And, and I do think that once children go back into school, I think the one thing to say is that where schools have been keeping in contact with children, whether it's virtually or sending information out, that that has been as a result of maybe perhaps concerns they've had. So they haven't just closed down that antennae. Um, if they had children they, had, they were concerned about beforehand, those are probably the children that they are prioritising to maintain contact with and ensure that they're getting information. So that that line of um, scrutiny remains. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 yes. I hear everything you're saying. And agree totally with you. And, and I suppose some of my worry would just be that sense of there's nothing more powerful than the observation of adults, certainly within the world of education and other sectors, that notices the small changes. Um, maybe in behaviour or if children become more withdrawn and that can be the flag that then leads to a conversation which could lead to a referral and I, I suppose it just underscores the importance of us getting back to normality and getting back to the schools having young people in them so that those types of uh, issues can be picked up. I suppose the second question um, is really just more to do with social services. I, I would have had a number of cases, and look, take the blanket perspective that 99.9% .9 of social workers do a fantastic job and a great job, and I acknowledge and respect that. But sometimes I would have um, parents that come in or have children referred in to the constituency office where they don't like 
the interaction that's going on between the, the social worker and the family. Has there, do you think there's been any impact on, on that as a result of the pandemic? Or I'm hearing you say there that, that, that social services are still maintaining their visits, which is good to hear. And as a sub part of that, one work of social services would be fostering. It, has there been much of a delay in the process of fostering, um, for example, for people that are applying to be foster parents? Is there much of a break putting that, or is a lot of the background work still taking place in the background? do you think? Well, guys, it's Kathleen here, and um, I'm sure some of the other panel members will want to address the first part of your question, but in terms of um, processes, my understanding is um, that uh, approvals are, are continuing to go ahead, both within the independent sector and within the statutory sector, um, and as I say, there are a number of people continuing to come forward. It isn't um, quite a time, can be quite a time consuming process, but at the beginning of uh, and then it's certainly in sort of um, March time when the trusts were putting their surge plans in place. My understanding is, is that they did quite a lot of work in terms of looking at the existing numbers of foster carers in the system and seeing um, what availability or capacity there was and, and that there is. Um, there is no doubt that we need to continue to do that and um, that I, I think it's really important that those processes don't stop. A lot of people who have indicated they're interested in fostering are thinking that they might wait until um, lockdown is lifted before they go through the whole process of assessment. Um, one of the elements of the modifications is around um, the enhanced disclosure certificate. Um, one of the proposals that we made in our paper to the committee is that we feel that um, where um, assessments are happening for foster carers, one of the potential barriers is where there has to be provision of medical advice and information in terms of to ensure that potential foster carers are fit and able and we have made some suggestions as to how there might be um, proposals made around how that could be um, speeded up and um, where that if that's a barrier to final approval and therefore placement um, of a child with that foster care that that might be a barrier that the department could seek to address in further iterations of the um, regulation. Okay. There, and if I can talk about the first part of your question, Colin, uh, just in terms of some of the, the issues that you would get into your constituency office, there's some crossover there, I think, in some of our own advocacy work. And quite often the difficulty being between children and families and maybe their social worker is difficulties down to communication and the relationship. And often it's because children and young people or their families feel that they're not being heard because they haven't been involved in pro appropriately in decision making. And sometimes through the process of advocacy, children and families are more involved. They get to hear the conversations and understand why decisions have been made and so can accept um, some of those decisions, even though they might not agree with them. So I think advocacy is really important to try and address and resolves issues at the very earliest point in time so that it doesn't have to move into more formal complaints procedures. Okay. Okay, good. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Going across now to Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks to the panel for, for your presentations. Um, a couple of questions and, and comments on the changes to regulations. Um, I think the Bernardos presentation said that they have significant concerns around the temporary amendments that they may inadvertently become permanent through extensions. I think that's a concern that uh, a couple of people and uh, groups may have as well. Um, I want to ask the question around the consequences of extending the, the time period where the safety reviews, the, the limit uh, in which safety reviews have to uh, take place. Uh, it's extending them from six months to nine months. And uh, a question uh, as to what happens or what would the panel think? Uh, what position that would put people who are in a position of neglect or abuse? Uh, would that um, further um, harm them? Uh, and a comment on that, uh, please. Um, the, uh, I mean, it's obviously not like for like, but I mean, there's a lot of questions over care homes and uh, lack of inspections or not uh, adequate inspections. So I would be concerned that it could be the case where uh, reviews are not taking place in the time that they should be, that people could be uh, neglected um, and that be uh, issues not be flagged, as, as people have indicated. Um, the NSPCC have said there's 567 children uh, waiting um, more than a month in 2018 for allocation of a social worker. 
Um, is there an expectation that this will increase um, after the coronavirus uh, crisis? And, and maybe just a comment uh, on the Human Rights Commission, who have said that the changes in the regulations seem to be more about staffing uh, and capacity rather than uh, children's rights. I would like to ask the panel their view uh, on that comment. Thank you. Okay, so it's Michelle James here again from Bernardo. So, just in, in terms of the the um, extended review periods, our concern is is that um, less frequent reviews would allow may allow care plans or placements to drift. Um, so, not necessarily that something may be neglected, but that they would have been drift, and that we wouldn't be um, doing things in a timely way in the child's time. So, uh, so that, that's my first bit. You then asked about um, the staffing situation. Um, I, I suppose it, it's been known for quite a, a while that there are significant um, staffing challenges, not just within the trust, but within the social work and social care sector. And I understand, and I'm part of a, um, of a workforce development group that is looking at um, our workforce challenges in social work and social care here in Northern Ireland, um, there, the, you know, I know that there's, um, there's been a number of recruitment drives. There's been conversations with the universities, and I think the department um, has a plan in place um, um, to look at that. And I suppose, um, yes, we, we, you know, so we, there are staffing challenges right across all of the sectors in, in those areas, and that's not just um, in social services. And that's my that's my experience. Um, I suppose the bit about the, the drift again is is um, I would want to make sure that when a child, if we're identifying that a child needs something, that they, that we're addressing that need immediately. It's taken a long time for um, these regulations to be embedded, the, the regulations that we currently have in legislation, for them to be embedded and implemented to a good standard. And my you know, my, my answer would be that, that we do constantly keep them under review. We don't want them to drift, and we don't want what we what is being proposed now to become common practice. Okay, thank you. Any of the other panel on those elements? Uh, yes, it's a letter from Whitepack here. Um, I would agree. I would think car leavers um, can be quite vulnerable at this particular time because, unlike their peers that are still living within care, they don't have the same support networks and so a month a lot can happen in a month to a young person who's just moved out of care never mind um three so i think i mean that is why the we um would ask and strongly would advocate that review meetings take place within the normal time scales or sooner um as suggested by the human rights commission particularly if new risks are identified uh, and if requested by the young person um, and I suppose it's, I mean, one of uh, my own agency's task is to make sure that young people know that they can request it um, earlier and that they do have access to advocacy support. Okay. Yeah, and uh, Kathleen, I would just echo the comments of um, both Alicia and, and Michelle um, and I do think that not just is there um, a challenge around the number of social workers in place but certainly the voluntary and community sectors has been quite hard hit by the, the pandemic and in, in terms of say mental health services for example lots of organizations out there who would be supplementing the work of the statutory agencies are under quite a, quite a bit of pressure um, I, I think that staffing is, is really crucially important and it is something that is impacting on delivery of services inevitably Thank you. Thank you, panel. And final, our final questions come uh, from Thank Alex. you, Chair. Uh, I'd just like to thank all those speaking this morning for the invaluable work that they do uh, for our young people. Uh, my question is, uh, does the panel think that relationships uh, between social workers and other professionals and those under their care uh, need a degree of rebuilding as a consequence of the lockdown? And will this present a difficult challenge for them? Um, I'd like to come in there, to, uh, Alicia from Voipec. Yep. We have a bit of a mantra in Voipec where we say relationships with social workers and with other adults is actually the golden thread. 
it is the one thing that can keep a young person safe and offer them some stability. We said earlier in our presentation that audiovisual technology does not replace uh, face-to-face contact at all. I think it can help in, enhance it and it is a good addition and I would like to see going ahead that um, we continue to see young people actually having lots more telephone contact and video contact in addition to their face-to-face meetings going forward um, because young people actually really value the support and the relationships that they have with social workers. They are, you know, they are um, outside of the carers and those adults that are with young people on a day-to-day. The relationship with a social worker is crucial because that is how that they can access all their, their rights and entitlements and um, get any resolution to their issues. Thank you. I would agree with that, um, Kathleen Toner. Um, I think that that relationships are the key of everything, and um, and I think right across all of our society at the minute, um, we are all struggling with uh, the, the ways in which we're having to communicate. And I, I don't know that it's the, I mean, the damage um, that you mentioned, I'm not sure if that's the case, but I certainly think it's something that we have to address for everyone. All of our professionals have been potentially adversely impacted as well, um, and we need to keep that in mind um, as we move forward and keep those relationships at the heart of everything that's done. Thank you. Um, Michelle James here. I would completely agree with and, and just echo what Kathleen and Alicia said, the effect in the long term, all, child, all children's social care, social work requires a relationship based approach. We, we also, like Alicia, we talk about relationships, relationships, relationships. It's the core, it's what will help children recover. Um, and those relationships with social workers are really, really important. I don't um, have any evidence to suggest there's damage, but if you haven't seen somebody for a long time, you're going to need um, to get to know just different ways, different things that have been going on and um, while you've not physically seen them. You know, if you think about it, if you haven't physically seen them, you might have seen a, a child or a, a, your daughter or a, your grandchild on a video chat, but, you, you know, it's different when you've got them straight, you know, right in front of you. So I think when, you know, we're able to have more face-to-face, um, then, you know, that will help rebuild relationships. But yes, as Catherine says, relationships are right at the core and also really good communication. There's opportunities for learning from, from the different methods of communication that have been developed over over the lockdown period, but that does not replace, it definitely cannot replace what happens face to face, especially for children who, you know, as Kathleen indicated earlier, don't have verbal communication, don't have English, aren't able to communicate because of their disability. I think there's just one thing I would add. I was actually at a meeting in social services yesterday and there were a lot of social workers there. Social workers like ourselves are, you know, work is, is still continuing. There are people who are going out and doing visits and, mm-hmm. um, you know, that service hasn't gone away. It's very much in place. And I think that um, my experience certainly working with trust colleagues and independent services colleagues is that they take that responsibility really very seriously and there have been some very creative approaches to maintaining contact whether it's been in a garden or at arm's length um, and that has continued to happen even in these very difficult challenging circumstances just just uh, best wishes going forward thank you okay thank you thank you thank you and i think that that point that that was touched upon the the reduction in the non-verbal communication, even across Zoom or on phones or whatever, is a significant concern as well. So I suppose that the quality of the engagement as well as the frequency is important and probably, and, and we know that from our own engagements here in terms of trying to do this type of work uh, over phone lines, and that is, does present increasing challenges. So listen, panel, I want to thank you all very, very much for coming along this morning, for presenting and for your que- answers to our questions and to wish you all the very best of luck in the time ahead in what's a very challenging time and in the work that you do with some of our most vulnerable marginalized and disadvantaged young people um, and and their carers indeed so thank you very much and just to wish you all the best gormay agav thank you chair thank you members i now propose we take a short break to get our next session teed up could we come back say at a quarter to quarter to twelve Yep, thank you.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This okay, members, Tamwaj Arash Arish. Uh, we are resuming now with the number section seven, the health uh, SL one, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Regulations 2020. The Department is proposing to make a statutory rule to require those arriving at a port from outside the common travel area to provide contact details, arrival information and details of their onward travel arrangements. The proposed statutory rule will also require all persons arriving in the North and who have been in a country other than Britain or Ireland within the previous 14 days to self-isolate. The self-isolation period runs for 14 days from the point at which they ended their journey from the country in question. The Department advises that given the rapidly evolving global situation, it has been unable to complete the regulatory and equality impacts. The operational date of the regulations is yet to be confirmed. However, it is expected to be around the end of May 2020. I can advise members that a departmental official is here via telephone today to brief the committee on the proposed statutory regulation. So can I now welcome Ms Elaine Colgan, Chief of Staff to the Chief Medical Officer. Uh, and Elaine, could you go ahead and please uh, brief the committee? Um, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chair, for your welcome uh, and good morning to the committee. Um, I'm, as, as the Chair said, I'm here today to provide an update to the committee and an overview of the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Regulations, which at this point we hope will come into effect from the 8th of June. Uh, I would just like to outline why we're introducing these regulations, what the requirements will be, and then touch briefly on some impact assessments that we have been able to do, and then I will obviously take some questions. So um, why are we introducing uh, this now? Uh, the decision to implement these measures now across the UK is based on the scientific advice. The rate of infection, or the R rate, UK-wide has declined. And imported cases are known to matter most when there is a low level of community transmission. When domestic transmission is very high, imported cases constitute such a small amount of the total that they make no significant difference to the epidemic. As we move to a situation where local incidence and prevalence is much lower, imported cases could become a higher proportion of the overall number of infections, and so preventing, um, to have, so preventing them can have some benefit. The benefit will be most significant when people are coming in from an area with a higher rate of infection than ours. So what will the regulations require? The draft regulations provide for two border measures. The first is a requirement for those for arriving from outside of the common travel area to provide contact information, including the address at which they intend to self-isolate and any onward travel plans they may have. Individuals would be required to provide these details on arrival or in advance of their arrival. The information would be available to the police for enforcement purposes and to the public health agency to undertake any contact tracing. The information collection will be undertaken by the UK Border Force and the Home Office on behalf of all UK regions. The regulations would require that the information is destroyed within 28 days of the person arriving in the UK. The second requirement within the draft regulations is a requirement for those travellers to self-isolate for 14 days following their arrival in the UK. And 14 days is based on the scientific evidence of the incubation period for the virus. Northern Ireland is proposing a slightly different approach to the other regions of the United Kingdom in order to capture those travelling through an Irish port to Northern Ireland with the requirement to self-isolate. But it is important to stress that this will not affect travel within the common travel area. This only impacts those who have been outside of the UK or Ireland within the previous 14 days. Those people will be required to self-isolate on their arrival in Northern Ireland until 14 days after they had left the country from which they travelled. This will also capture passengers transiting through other UK regions en route to Northern Ireland from abroad. The regulations would permit people to, self, to leave self-isolation for limited purposes, including to obtain food or medical supplies, to access medical treatment, and to exercise alone. People will not be expected to self-isolate from other members of their own household. 
As I mentioned, at the moment we are hoping that the regulations would come into operation on Monday the 8th of June. Thereafter, they would be reviewed every three weeks in the same way that the restrictions regulations are. It is proposed that the regulations would um, cease to have effect after one year of coming into operation. Uh, there are, for practical reasons, there are certain categories of person that will be exempt from the requirement to self-isolate. Examples include those working on essential border security, non-UK diplomat, flight crew and some other transport staff, those travelling to undertake work as a health professional, prison escorts and small workers. As regards to enforcement, the executive will determine the final approach to be taken, but we do foresee some police powers to ensure that PSI can deal effectively with the breach if it comes to their attention. And it is likely that there will be some sort of fine mechanism, perhaps in a similar system to the fixed penalty notice within the restriction regulations. And finally, I would just like to outline some of the impact <coughs> that we have been able to complete. So we have assessed the impact of these measures, both in terms of Section 75 countries and the Human Rights Act. The equality screening identified a minor positive impact for all those groups who, for whom the current evidence suggests that there is a disproportionate risk of developing more severe cases of COVID-19. So at the moment, that was for racial groups, older people, and for those with disabilities. No other impact was identified. In terms of the human rights assessment, that we did identify some interference with a number of the articles in the, the Convention for Human Rights. But in the circumstances of the pandemic, these were deemed to be justified. I would just like to highlight specifically the case of Article on the Right to Liberty. It found that the flexibility of would be such that it would not impose the deprivation of liberty. For example, no one will be under any supervision or control as to what they do within their accommodation. A person may break self-isolation in defined circumstances and there are categories of persons who have an exemption from the measure. Uh, I hope that was a helpful summary, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you, Elaine. Um, first one from me would be, when do the department <coughs> intend to make the statutory rule? Um, the, the drafting is well progressed. We hope to make it the early, early next week, um, but that is uh, subject to getting some final, final policy areas settled. Okay, and secondly, then there has been reference both in, in your presentation and in the media to the common travel area and the uh, travellers from France. So, what are the arrangements in terms of uh, in terms of Ireland being clearly an epidemiological unit, but also the island of Britain being a separate epidemiological unit? What are what are the rationale behind that common travel area and France, and where where do those both sit at this point in time in terms of your planning? Okay, in, in terms of France, uh, the, there is no blanket exemption from travellers from France. Uh, the only exemption is for some board, um, channel tunnel workers. Uh, so th that, that's no longer uh, the case that there would be an exemption from all travellers through France. Uh, in terms of the common travel area, um, yes, so within, travel within the common travel area is entirely permitted and unaffected by the regulations. So a person can travel freely between Ireland and Britain. Uh, we don't propose to introduce any um, restrictions for those people that are travelling between Ireland and Britain at this point, unless they have been outside of those two areas. And what's the evidence base for that? Given we have heard from, we have heard in the committee here about the need to, you know, maximise the benefits of being an island and travel on to the entire island. So. What's the seven scientific basis for that decision? Um, the scientific evidence has, uh, for the policy has been at a, at a high level in terms of introducing this to the common travel area. Um, there hasn't been, as far as I'm aware, scientific consideration of within the common travel area at a UK level. Um, I'm happy to come back to committee on that if that would be helpful. Yeah, I think it would because clearly you could have you know vastly different rates of transmission at a given time or rates in the R number at a given time in say uh, London, which is a which is a major international hub. Okay, so we we would appreciate uh, additional information on that. The other question, uh, the, the final question from me before I go to members is in relation to passenger health locator forms that are being brought in. 
in the 26 counties and that th that information can then be shared. Are there plans to put passenger locator forms into use here for people arriving so that they can be traced onward either here or within the 26 counties? Um, yes, yeah, so at the moment the, I understand that those people arriving into um, the, the South would not have to provide contact details if they are travelling onward to Northern Ireland. So we are working very closely with our counterparts in the South um, to try to find a, a solution in the longer term about uh, collecting the, the information for, um, for, for the people travelling to each of our jurisdictions through the other one. That makes sense. So we are working closely with them on that. And do, does that mean you do have plans for passenger locator forms? For um, our requirement in the regulation to provide information is in effect an online passenger locator form for the UK, and that will be administered by Border Force. So Ireland, I understand, has a, a paper form at the moment, um, whereas this it, it will be a similar similar thing. Only ours will be an online version. And will they be will they be able to communicate with each other in in line with the memorandum of understanding? Will they be able to be to be read from each other if they're different systems? Um, uh, what we haven't um, covered yet is, is any data agreements if they're needed to share the forms themselves. Um, however, I would stress that um, sharing information for contact tracing purposes is ongoing north and south and has been since the start of this epidemic, uh, and there is processes in place for that. Okay. Okay, I'm going to go now to members, and I'll go first to Paula. Um, good morning, and thank you. Well, good afternoon, Polly. Now, thank you very much. I mentioned at Health Committee um, a few weeks back around the repatriation flights that went to Romania, and I said very clearly at the time that the people on those flights will have the right um, to come back um, to Northern Ireland when they choose and settle back in our communities and contribute to our economy, etc. Um, the thought of those families and other um, others coming back after the pandemic um, and sitting at home um, for 14 days when they're really here to work, to earn money, to feed their families seems quite um, difficult to maintain. How do they then come back after months of not being in the country and with no food in their cupboards? Um, they, many of them will live in houses of multiple occupancy in places like the Holy Land and South Belfast, so they don't live in distinct dwellings, so they will be mixing with people who, who are already here. Um, so I suppose there's issues there around surveillance and um, also linguistic barriers and cultural variances. So how do these regulations take account of um, people like um, the Romanians and others who come here to work? Thank you. Um, thanks, um, Paula, for the question. Uh, yes, that's, that's an important question. So there's a couple of things I'd just like to say in terms of that. So firstly, in terms of uh, returning and not having provisions within the house, the regulations do allow um, that to happen. So where a person is coming home and they don't have provisions in the house, they are able to go and get food and medical supplies and, and to get in things that they need in the house before that they begin their self-isolation. Um, there, there is also, in terms of the, the houses of multiple occupancy, as long as this is a sort of a, a residency and a home, they will be still able to self-isolate there. Um, there, the, there will be guidance given to passengers um, both at booking, um, in, at check-in and during transit flights and other um, mess, uh, vessels, advising them about what to do if they become symptomatic, how to um, engage with the contact tracing process in the country. So that's where the surveillance mem me issue that you mentioned comes in. Uh, so the, the public health advice that's current for all people in Northern Ireland would to come into play there. In terms of language, I understand that the Home Office is providing um, the, the form in multiple languages. Um, we can double check that and confirm that with the committee. Can I ju just clarify then in terms of the practicalities of, of people who are coming here to work and then asking them to sit at home when they have a job to go to for two weeks, is it, is it, is it really achievable? Um, well, what I would say is at the moment Northern Ireland doesn't as yet have direct flights from the sure, Europe, from European fact. Union. We are going to review these regulations every three weeks and obviously the, any um, increase in international flights and any desti particular destinations those come from will be part of that review. Um, but yes, at this point they would have to 
return and be at home for two weeks unless the, the job that they were here to do fell in with one of the categories of exemption. Okay, sorry, just for clarity, the, the flights were going in and out of Dublin, but thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, going now to Jerry. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's a, there's a certain element of rationale for monitoring uh, people coming in and the virus and, and so forth, but I think there's some questions that I would have. Um, I mean, there's been questions uh, prior to this crisis uh, for a number of years about people being stopped uh, travelling north and south and south to north um, based on their uh, on their race. So I think there there could be questions flagged up around the racial profiling of people. So if you could answer how that's being uh, mitigated against, um, I'm also concerned that this would be on statute, if I heard you correctly, for a year. And there's other um, sort of less draconian measures, if you will, that don't be uh, don't seem to be on place uh, on statute for as long as that. And so, uh, can the measures be annulled uh, shorter than a year? Uh, and if that's the case, how does that happen? Um, and just two other quick points: um, Is it only people advised to stay at home and self-isolated, or is it enforced? And if it is enforced, um, is it the police or is it uh, somebody else? Um, and yes, yeah, right. The other point, just I mean, obviously, you said there's no restrictions between people coming uh, from Britain and Ireland, and Ireland and Britain, and I'm certainly not advocating restrictions. But it would seem strange to me that with Britain having the se second highest death toll in the world, we're advocating restrictions from people not from Britain, um, but from other countries. So maybe a, a comment um, as to why that is from yourself would be useful. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jerry, for this question. Um, the, the statute, yes, so being on statute for a year, yes, we can annul those regulations at any time before that if they're no longer deemed necessary, and we would do that. Um, the, the frequency of the review is currently 21 days, so if any of those reviews highlighted that the regulations were no longer appropriate or required, they would be either amended or um, repealed. Uh, the racial profiling, I'm, I'm not really sure that there's too much I can say on that in terms of uh, how that would operate. The, there's no plans, there's nothing in the regulations that would require a person being stopped um, crossing any of the regions in the common travel area. And uh, So th this shouldn't be used as a requirement to stop people uh, at this point. Um, the the self-isolation uh, enforcement provisions, um, it, it is going to be the final enforcement policy is going to be for the executive to determine. We do foresee that the police will have powers to deal with a breach in some way, whether that's through a fine or a fixed penalty notice. Um, so it's, it, it is slightly stronger than uh, advisory, uh, but I can't confirm at this point what the exact force measures will be. Um, and, and there is uh, no plans to introduce restrictions um, between regions of the common travel area. Uh, it is something that can be looked at in the review of regulations, and I've uh, I welcome back to the committee on whether there's been any scientific consideration of that uh, already at the moment. I just couldn't, couldn't hear just one of the, the answers about um, the enforcement regulations. Did you say sorry, that's the executive to determine? Uh, yes, the executive is determining the final enforcement policy. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go across to Alan and then I'm going to go to the members on the phone. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I, I'm conscious of the fact that the bulk of uh, international flights that are coming into the island of Ireland uh, at the moment uh, would be coming uh, into Dublin Airport. Uh, I'm very conscious of the fact that the first case of COVID uh, in Northern Ireland uh, was brought in by someone returning on a flight from Italy through Dublin Airport. I, the, these uh, regulations uh, obviously are going to make it a legal requirement uh, for residents of Northern Ireland uh, returning from overseas to uh, self-isolate uh, for 14 days. But the regulations in the Republic of Ireland, uh, I note in the report, are voluntary for 14 days. So could it be the case that someone uh, living in Northern Ireland who flies in from the continent into Dublin Airport uh, travels uh, back up to Northern Ireland, uh, refuses uh, to uh, self-isolate, um, are, are they then guilty of a crime, or does the fact that they have 
arrived from, uh, they would claim they have arrived uh, from the Republic of Ireland. Uh, does that uh, put them outside uh, any enforcement action? Um, if a, the requirement to self-isolate in our regulation applies regardless of how you arrive to Northern Ireland, it focuses on where you've been. So it looks the question, have you been in a country outside of the common travel area in the last 14 days? If the answer to that is yes, then you should be self-isolating until the 14th day has passed from which you left that country. So if a person was to travel to Dublin Airport to Northern Ireland, as you outlined, and they refused to self-isolate, then they would be guilty of an offence under our draft regulations. Action could then be taken according to the enforcement policy that the executive uh, settled on. So it's no defence to uh, for someone to claim that they have actually arrived from the Republic of Ireland as opposed to any other destination? Not for the self-isolation requirement, no. Okay. Chair, on thank that. Yeah, Pam, I'll take you in now and then I'll go to the phones. Go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you. And just on the back of Fallon's question there, so um, if, if someone is, is coming in from, uh, is travelled into Dublin from a, another area and then end up in Northern Ireland, how is that, how is that tracked? Is it, how is that information gathered? How do we know that that person has been elsewhere in Europe or the rest of the world? And uh, how, how would we know to take action if they weren't um, voluntarily self-isolating? Yeah, that, that's a very good point, and it's one that uh, we're consciously trying to work on over the next couple of days. Um, so at the minute, the only information that would be gathered for that person is the part of the passenger form that they have to fill in for, for, the, for Ireland. Um, but that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have a, a, a mechanism to necessarily share that information. Um, I would stress again that we are sharing information where it becomes relevant for track and trace, and there is a place for that. Um, but yes, at the moment, if a person was to travel through Dublin, that we wouldn't necessarily be aware that they had been abroad. Um, the enforcement would, would the, the, the breach of the, of the regulations would have to, in some way, come to the attention of the enforcement officers before they would be able to take action. Um, so we are trying to address that um, in, in the policy and in implementation. Okay, thank you. And can I also then ask, and it's kind of backs on to Paula's question as well, in terms of houses multiple occupancy. Um, so obviously if an individual is self-isolating for 14 days, but they, you said that they, um, their family were not, they don't have to stay away from their family or whoever's in their household. Um, so in that circumstance, is, is, that, is the risk not that um, if they are infected, but maybe not even symptomatic, that um, all members of that household are at risk, and, and I presume they're not being um, tracked or traced unless they show a symptom? Um, yes, that's right. Um, so if the, the advice that would be the case in that situation, so if a person um, within the household, whether it was the traveller or not, would become symptomatic, they would all have to self-isolate under the public health guidance at the moment, um, and that would continue to be the case. Um, there, sorry. Sorry, was someone... No, sorry, go ahead. I thought it, uh, go ahead. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the, the public health uh, guidance and the advice on symptomatic self-isolation and being in contact with a symptomatic case would kick in. Um, it, there is a provision within the regulations and the Home Office are providing this for all of the regions of the UK for a person to avail of uh, a booking facility where they can um, get accommodation um, separately from others if they wish uh, and there be a facility for that, although it will be at their own expense. Um, but we are trying to um, provide a way for people that haven't got out somewhere away from other people to self-isolate for them to have access quickly to arranging accommodation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Elaine, in your, in your answer there, your previous answer, you referenced uh, testing and tracing infrastructure. And is, is there any attempt to link uh, the robustness of testing and, and tracing systems in place in various places? And I note that there are significant concerns today across the water in terms of the rollout of the tracing programme 
in England has been extremely um, is being criticised. So has that been factored into the 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 SL one or the SR? Um, the the these um, requirements and the the track and trace program have been running separately. So I haven't been involved in the detail in that. The only uh, connection that we have is that the information is able to be shared from the passenger form that's collected for the purposes of contact tracing from the public health agency. Um, as to how this operates in Northern Ireland, I'm not familiar with, but I can find out more further information on that if the committee would like. Okay, I, I'm going to the phones now in a second, but I just want to note that the SL1 has come before us. Uh, it's come before the policy has been finalised, and there's a number of issues now that you have said that you come back with additional information, or things haven't been finalised or clarified. Now, now we understand that you, we understand your pressure, but the committee have been asked to take a view without all the info being included, and that is that is far from ideal. Yes, and I can only apologise to the committee um, for that. Uh, we are trying to as best that we can to move this forward um, quite quickly and to introduce a very tight time scale. So yes, I, I do apologise uh, on behalf of the department for that. Okay, I'm going to go across now to the phones there, and I'll. Uh, or Leah, are you on the phone? Yes. Um, thank you, Chair, yep. and thanks, Elaine. Um, you've already touched on some of these issues with some of the other members, but just maybe if you could clarify a wee bit more um, around the issue of um, who will will be carrying out any physical um, checks and where or how will these checks take place. Um, across the island. Um, I'm not sure if it will be health officials or you had mentioned border force. And then my second question is, um, have you looked at a system, any sort of, putting any sort of system in place to um, establish or check in on the self-isolation status of people then who have travelled into the country and who have went into self-isolation? Is there any process to Check in on them then to see if the, the, the you know they might have contracted the coronavirus or not. Thank you, Elaine. Okay, I'll I'll deal with the physical check first. So border force are only responsible for enforcing the provision of information. They are not able to enforce anything else. So they should only be taking an active enforcement role at airports and ports. Uh, so if a person arrives, uh, and they will do some spot checking to check that they have completed the form. When a person completes the form online, the intention is they will then get an electronic receipt, and um, they, the border force, will do spot checking uh, to check that people are completing it as required. Um, and there will be some uh, interaction with carriers on that to inform the spot checking. So carriers are also, uh, on a voluntary basis, um, going to check that before the person boards that they have completed the form, so they will be able to alert the border force on roughly how many of the passengers had completed that before the, they left the destination, uh, and that the, self, the checks can be adjusted accordingly then, so if not very many people had filled it in at that point, then they may up the sampling. Um, border force won't be responsible for enforcing anything in terms of self-isolation, and that's not proposed at this point. Um, the enforcement for self-isolation would remain with the PSNI, uh, in terms of the, the calls, the option for calls for self-isolation, it's something that we're currently exploring, um, of whether or not there would be merit in uh, contacting people who are checked that they're intent, self-isolating as intended, but also to provide them with some public health advice to ask about their symptoms, to see if they're symptomatic, uh, and if they are, to provide advice on how they go about getting tested. Uh, so that that is in Are you still there, Elaine? Yes, sorry. Can you, you cut off. Me? You cut off quite abruptly at the end there. Just oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going then, or Leah. I'm going then across on the phones to Pat. Are you there, Pat? Yes, I'm here, Chair. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, Pat. Uh, thanks for that, Elaine. Elaine, there seems to be there seems to be quite a few loopholes in this. Um, first of all, the issue has been mentioned of. Uh, people travelling in from the south uh, who don't declare that uh, they have been uh, uh, outside uh, these two islands in the last 14 days. Uh, if there isn't some procedure or protocol in place, 
for that information that's being collected in the South to be shared here, then it seems to be quite a loophole. The other issue is is uh, um, separate facilities for isolation. Um, you've said that in some situations, uh, and I wasn't sure whether you were referring to across the water or here, the facilities for isolation will be made available, but the person will have to pay for themselves. themselves. Now, imagine a situation where someone arrived here in this country, uh, arrives in the south, travels north to come home, for example, that they have lived here and discover that their family are isolating because they uh, are showing symptoms of COVID. Uh, and they have nowhere else to go, uh, and they don't have money to pay for uh, staying in a hotel or isolating somewhere like that. Well, what's expected to happen in those circumstances? Um, so, yeah, you, I'll take the, the first comment about the, the lack of data from the arrivals from the site. Um, yes, I, I can't... Uh, defend that one at this point. Um, we are aware that that is a problem, that we won't know who has come through, but that yes, they will still be covered with the requirement to self-isolate. Um, we are actively seeking a solution on that. Um, it may not be in place for the regulations early next week, but certainly by the first review, we would hope that we would have either a, a legal solution or perhaps one that just needs to be done on an implementary basis. Um, Separate facilities for self-isolation. Uh, that's yes, that's a that's a case actually that would be quite tricky because the example that you gave, the person wouldn't be encountering any border force uh, staff. Uh, however, there is going to be online guidance for where how they go about contacting um, to re to arrange that accommodation. Um, some of it, the, the the when they contact, they will be informed about how much the accommodation is. There is. I understand, um, and we have to get comfort from the Home Office, but there may be provision for emergency accommodation if the person has no access to funds, but I do need to follow that up with them. Um, they, they agreed to confirm that uh, earlier in the week on a call. Uh, have, have, has there been any uh, study done of what has been done in other jurisdictions? I understand the UK government has done some of those uh, at a central level before proposing um, these because they looked at a number of options, including screening at airports and things uh, of arrivals and temperature okay. checks and things like that, so that those options were assessed at a central level. So, so we're just following um, whatever the UK is doing? Is that what you're telling me? Um, we are to a certain extent. Um, so the UK initiated this policy and we are, we have, a, the executive has agreed to, to adopt um, something, something similar. We are making a couple of differences. One is to capture the self-isolation requirement for those coming through Ireland from abroad. Um, we're also taking a slightly, proposing to take a slightly more flexible approach in terms of what we are able to do during self-isolation and um, taking, uh, taking account of like, evidence and the level of associated. Uh, so that we we kind of felt that it was important to ensure that any restrictions were uh, on freedom of movement, particularly, um, were justified. So we have allowed a bit more flexibility um, in the UK with that. Yeah, okay, Liam. Okay, thank Pat. Pat, I'm going to Pat, I'm going to um, I'm going to move on there slightly. Um, I just want to check: do member any other members have any additional questions before I go back to Pat there, and also uh, that all east-west checks. Are they being shared as well, Elaine, in relation to the, the we've talked about the north south, but east west checks, are those being shared across the system? In terms of people travelling between the UK regions? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, there, when you're at your first point of arrival into the UK, whichever region that is, you have to fill the form in. Um, on that form, it asks you to detail any over travel plans, uh, and it also asks for your address where you're self-isolating. So if you arrive into one region, but you plan to self-isolate in another, there is a way of capturing that information. Does that answer your question? And, and what's the way of capturing it? It's all on the same form. So mm -hmm. where the person will give the flight details or the, the transport details on which they've just arrived, and that will indicate where in the UK they've arrived. 
and then they will also give the destination of the address where they're going to self-isolate. So if that's in a different UK region, then that will be captured. And considering that this is a health a health issue, what's the rationale for Border Force being uh, the holder of that information rather than health officials? And do you not recognise that that, that that in itself could present data issues? Uh, so the rationale for Border Force holding it Border Force are, just collect, are the ones being asked to collect it because that's the first um, point of contact when a person arrives. Uh, they will pass that on to the public health bodies, um, and so we, they're really collecting it on our behalf um, because in terms of implementation, that's the easiest thing for, for that to happen. We are supporting the regulations with data agreements as necessary and data, impact, uh, assess, data protection impact assessments as well. Okay. Um I'm going to go back to Pat for one final quick question because I do want to get a chance for to discuss this as a committee. Obviously, there are, there are a number of issues there are raising. Quick question, Pat. Yeah, it's just the reason I asked about looking at other uh, other examples in other jurisdictions is that since uh, the 20th of April, 93 percent of countries had border restrictions. Uh, would it not be wise to take a look at that just rather than blindly following whatever the London government says? Um, yes, yeah, so the, whenever the UK set the policy, they looked at what measures were in place in other countries and assessed them at the UK-wide level. So we didn't do separate assessments in Northern Ireland uh, on, on to, to have a look and see what those restrictions were. Um, we did a site of some of their analysis uh, in terms of the fact that they'd considered other options. I don't think that's particularly wise, but thank you anyway. Yeah, I'd, I'd, have, I'd have to say I agree with that, Elaine. In terms of, I mean, one of one of the one of the things that there are concerns around is the fact that we didn't make full use of the fact that we had devolved health here, and that we could have tailored some of these things to our unique circumstances. So I think I think it would be a concern that that benefit hasn't been utilised once again, and that we're just simply lifting off the shelf a model where we could have took the best elements of it and took account of the particular issues that we have here. So um, I'll thank you there, Elaine. Uh, I thank you for your presentation and for your answers to the questions. Um, you have noted uh, the, uh, the, the difficulties around the uh, information not being complete at this stage. So we'll have a discussion, and thank you for your presentation today. We can uh, let you go with that. Thanks. Thank you. OK. OK, members, um, we've, we've heard the discussion there, so I suppose we just need to have a, a we need to take a consideration here as to as to how we proceed in this. Do members have a view or members want to make a comment? Alan? Well, Chairman, just uh, just on your remarks there about uh, lifting the, 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 the London model. Um, the London model is uh, imposing uh, a legislative 14-day self-isolation uh, from overseas countries, and some people may consider that that's a very wise uh, thing to do, and a very careful thing to do. Um, would you prefer uh, that we adopt uh, the, the model uh, which is pertaining in the Republic of Ireland at the moment of voluntary self-isolation. Do you feel that that would be, is, is that a better model for, for us here in the north of Ireland to uh, adopt rather than the uh, legislative self-isolation? Well, I suppose I, my preference would be that we would examine best practice wherever it arises and, and implement it, I suppose, would be my own. Jerry? Yeah, thanks. I think it was a useful presentation, and from from my part, there's a lot of questions that remain unanswered about this. I mean, uh, questions are still around racial profiling that are raised, uh, enforcement mechanisms that the executive are meant to set out. We don't know what they are. We haven't seen them, so I don't feel comfortable um, being able to support this uh, SR today. I don't know if I need to formally propose or vote on that, but I just want to uh, make my comments. Uh, make my comments. Okay. Other members. Well, Chair, we don't have to take a view as a, as a committee, uh, or we can agree not to take a view. Is that right? Well, I, I suppose we, we do need to take a view, but defer. We, we would have the option to defer, and I think that may be, that may be something yeah. for some of the other information to come forward. Suppose, I'll come to the phones in a yeah, second. I haven't forgot about this. In fairness, you know, we're, we're at a starting point of a new you know, policy, um, which would seem common sense. And yes, there absolutely seems to be some loopholes and. Uh, things that can be done better. I'm not sure how they're done, but they obviously have to be looked into. Um, so I think a 
think we have to start somewhere. That's the first thing. And I think then we need to look, and government needs to look at how it can be done better and in with cooperation from the um, Republic of Ireland. I think it would be useful um, to hear more about how um, the South is, is going to deal with the issue. Uh, that might be useful just in going forward and looking at how we can do it better. Okay, and members on the phone? Yes, so Pat here. Yeah, go ahead, Pat, first, please, and then we'll come to you earlier. Uh, I mean, I, I agree with what you have said yourself, that we need to be looking to international best practice. And it seems this regulation, you know, you could drive a coach and horses through it as it stands, uh, despite the fact that we've had so much time to put in place restrictions like this, it seems to have been very rushed, uh, and there are so many loopholes in it. It just seems to me that uh, it wouldn't work well at all. If the, if, the, if the rationale is to minimise the spread of the virus uh, and save legs, I'm not sure that this, this uh, regulation is going to uh, help all that much. OK, and Orlea? Yes, um, Chair, if, if I could just clarify um, one thing that's come up a few times. My understanding is that in the South, that actually from today, the, the self-isolation is mandatory. So um, I think from the, the briefing that we had today, there's certainly a lot of within it. I would be concerned if they're aiming to make the statute route early next week. Um, the 8th of June was mentioned. We don't have enough information. Um, so, I mean, I would agree with, with, with Jerry and others. I wouldn't be content on taking any sort of view on it today until we get a lot more detail about what's contained within this um, and, and to make sure that whatever direction or method we're taking is based on sound evidence and models of best practice. Okay. Thank you. Can I, can I propose, me members, maybe that we defer this and wait till, the, to, till we see next week and wait more information which has been acknowledged? Would members be content to defer? Yeah. Okay, members are content with that. Okay, members, we are now going to take a break for lunch. We are obviously in an all-day sitting today with, in effect, an additional meeting this afternoon to consider some other uh, significant issues. So I'm proposing now that we take a break for lunch. And could members return by 1.15, please? We'll be starting at 1.15. Thank you. Okay. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.